Uh, hi everybody, this is Dr. Houts and we are going to move on to Unit 6 and start with Chapter 16, which is all about DNA. So this is very fun stuff. Uh, this is just posted in here from the study guide, so I'm going to try to do the screencast along, following along the study guide. So the first part of this is just the search for figuring out what actually is causing traits to be inherited, protein or DNA. All right, and there's three experiments we're going to talk about. Uh, quick review, you know, this is Mendel, and, you know, he figured out that traits are passed along, uh, the rules for how that happens. And then Thomas Hunt Morgan did a lot of work figuring out the chromosomal basis of inheritance. And this was chapter 15 that we just spent a long time on. So meiosis and all of that. So that was known when they started to try to figure out what was the exact particle causing traits to be passed down. Okay, uh, this is just a picture of a DNA or a chromosome with these histone proteins. So you probably remember that this does exist as a complex of DNA and nucleic acid, chromosomes do, and these proteins are involved in the packaging of the DNA. So the question was, which of those two molecules is actually the thing responsible for passing on traits? Okay, is it the proteins or the DNA? So that's the question. Um, and so a lot of people did think it was the proteins, which is a pretty logical thought considering the amount of diversity in the world of proteins, right? There's 20 amino acids. You can get, you know, I'm not good at math, but many millions of combinations of those amino acids, which could generate, you know, a lot, they generate a lot of diverse proteins. And so I can understand why they might think it was the proteins given the range of traits that we're, they were observing. Uh, you know, this is just a quick slide showing you some of the functions of proteins. You've seen this before, but you know, obviously proteins do many, many different jobs. Okay, the other candidate was nucleic acids. All right, and we're gonna get into the structure of the nucleic acids uh, soon, but there's four bases in DNA. Oh, sorry, this is the RNA side and there's four in DNA. So there's only four building blocks for nucleic acids, as opposed to the 20 building blocks for proteins. So, you know, they did think it was protein, or it could be, um, which is what they were trying to discern from these experiments. So we're gonna just go through three experiments that are pretty classic experiments in biology, actually, kind of groundbreaking. And you don't have to memorize all the details, but you do need to understand what did each experiment contribute to our understanding. Okay, so the first one was 1928. This is the Griffith experiment. And what he did was he took this strain of pneumococcal bacteria, two different strains actually. One was called rough because it had a polysaccharide coat on the outside. And the other was called smooth because it did not have that coat. And they already knew that this rough coated version, strain R, if you infected it into mice, the mice, you know, they lived just fine. Healthy mouse. If you infected the smooth strain or the S strain into mice, the mice died. Okay, so the S strain is virulent because it causes this mouse to die. And the R strain is non-virulent. So they knew this going in. So he chose to use these two strains of bacteria. All right, then he heat killed the S strain. So he heated it up which generally is going to denature proteins, right? Uh, and infected it into the mouse and the mouse lived. So whatever he did by heating it seems to have uh, removed the virulent properties. Okay, normally, you know, the S strain caused the mice to die. If he heat killed that S strain, the mice lived, okay? Uh, the bacteria were dead. All right, but then this is the good one. He mixed them together. So he mixed the rough strain, which alone does not cause the mice to die, and the heat killed S strain, which also alone does not cause the mice to die, and the mouse died. So that is weird. Something is going on, all right, because neither of these alone cause the mice to die. Okay, and then he isolated blood from that dead mouse, and he found living S bacteria in there. He could culture the S strain of bacteria from that mouse, all right? So something is happening, all right? And what he came up with was this thing called transformation, 
uh, because he said something from the heat killed S strain is transforming the non-virulent R strain into a virulent strain. It's causing the mice to die. So this concept of transformation, uh, we're going to come back to, but generally it means something is getting changed into, oftentimes we're thinking about cancer, like a cancerous cell or a virulent cell. So something from this S strain was transforming that R strain and causing the mice to die. Okay, so that was a very interesting finding that something was changing that R strain. All right, and this is just a summary. Okay, and then after that, in 1944, these three people um, wanted to continue those studies. So they took the R strain and they tried to fraction out different parts of the S strain to see which part of the S strain of bacteria would give transformation. So here's the experiment, okay? They took heat killed S cells, all right? And they took, you know, fractions of it. So they have three different samples. And to this sample, they added an enzyme that would degrade the proteins. So this tube has no protein. Remember, they're trying to figure out if it's protein or DNA still. To this tube, they added an enzyme that would denature the RNA. So this has no RNA. And then to this tube, they added an enzyme that would denature the DNA. This tube has no DNA. So hopefully you remember that ASE usually is the ending for an enzyme. So a protein ACE is an enzyme that degrades protein, etc. Okay. So then they took these fractions and they mixed them with uh, R cells. Okay. They added rough colonies to each fraction and then they tried to detect whether they were getting any living S cells. In other words, could transformation still happen in each of these tubes? So in this first one, when they have no protein, they added rough cells and yes, they were able to get S living S cells to appear. So transformation was still going on with the heat killed fraction that lacks protein and R cells. Okay, so it appears that protein isn't what's causing this transformation. All right, in the tube that doesn't have any RNA, they added R cells, you know, the rough cells. And again, they were able to get transformation to happen and living S cells appeared. Okay, so it doesn't seem that RNA is the component that's causing transformation. In the tube that is, doesn't have any DNA, because they added the enzyme to degrade the DNA, when they added the R cells, they did not detect any living S cells. Okay, so we can no longer get transformation to happen if there's no DNA. Okay, so the really big conclusion then is that this transformation event requires DNA. So therefore, DNA appears to be the genetic material of the cell. All right, uh, so there you go. That was a pretty good experiment. Actually, it was very clever. Um, and then we move on to this Hersey Chase experiment in 1952. So uh, at this point, they are pretty sure that it's DNA, and they wanted to, this. This group did one more, another experiment again to try to validate that it was DNA and not protein. So again, this is pretty clever. Okay, they used this virus called a bacteriophage, which is a very simple virus that infects bacteria, and it's got this really weird structure looks like a lunar landing module with these legs and then this part up here is a protein head and inside of that is the genetic material of the virus okay and then they took two different um well they two different groups of virus and this one they grew in sulfur that was radioactive and in this one they grew in phosphorus that was radioactive so the reason is because they wanted to label the protein using the sulfur, radioactive sulfur, because proteins have sulfur and DNA doesn't. So the radioactive sulfur is gonna radioactively label the proteins. The one that's got radioactive phosphorus is gonna radioactively label the DNA because DNA has phosphate in it and it doesn't have any sulfur. Okay, so here is just a picture. This is a couple different amino acids that contain sulfur. And then in the DNA over here, in this nucleic acid, you know, phosphate groups on there. 
Okay, so they use sulfur to label the protein and phosphorus to label the DNA. All right, and here's what the experiment looks like. So on this left-hand side, this is the sample with the radioactive sulfur. Uh, so here you can see this genetic material is in this protein head of this bacteriophage. The bacteriophage lands on the cell, and the way they, the virus infects the cell is that it injects whatever is in this head up here into the cell. Okay, so they did that, and then they separated out the viral particles from the bacteria, and they tested to see which part of it has the radioactivity. Okay, and they were able to detect the fact that only in these viruses was there radioactive sulfur and not anything inside the cell. Okay, so in this case, it appeared that whatever's getting injected into the cell, uh, it's not protein because the protein with the radioactive label all got separated out. All right, in this sample, it's now got the DNA that's labeled. The bacteria virus lands on the bacteria. It shoots its contents inside the cell. So whatever's in this protein head gets injected into the cell. Uh, they mixed them up and then they separated out the different parts. So they, did, they spun it in a centrifuge and they separated out the viral particles from the bacteria and they could see that all of the radioactivity was now inside that bacterial cell and none of it was not in there. So none of it was in these viral particles. Okay, so they concluded that DNA is what's causing this infection and is carrying the information because in this case now, this DNA is gonna cause new viral particles to get made and the cell to you know, make a bunch of viruses. Okay, so this is another good validation that DNA is what's causing this infection and not protein. Okay, and so that DNA must be carrying the information. All right, so now uh, they are pretty convinced that it's actually DNA that's carrying the genetic information. Okay, and then we'll talk about the structure of DNA.